proving the Earth isn't flat, doing the great circle route in the hangar. I used to be a well-respected member of the aviation community, and then I started flying to Cirrus and that changed. Oh, well, that was great until the engine quit. And all of a sudden I see these explosions and these trees exploding. I'm walking away a better pilot because of this discussion. Welcome to In the Hangar. I'm Christy Wong, and today we're talking international ferry flights, and we're not talking about Tinkerbell. All right, so. <laughs> you spell that F E R R Y. Oh, not F -A -I -R -Y. okay, see? <laughs> that makes more sense now. All right, we're here today. <laughs> we're here today with Deanna Wallace and Joe Casey. So, you guys recently did something called the Great Circle Route. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, we took an airplane from, we got a call to go to Tahiti, which is out in the South Pacific, and fly an airplane back to the United States, a King Air 350. So it was a great airplane. And, um, but if you look at the route that we ended up having to go, we didn't go to, a lot of times you would take an airplane like that and then go up to Hawaii and then over the States, and it makes a fairly short right. ferry flight. So why couldn't you go to Honolulu? Well, something happened with the ferry tank, and we couldn't get, see, to fly from Honolulu to San Francisco, that's a long way, and you need an airplane with lots of fuel. So the King Air that we were flying can't make that distance. We couldn't add the ferry tank. So I got to do what I call the Great Circle Route, because it looks like a huge circle that I made Okay. If, if you fly the flight. But I flew from Tahiti up through the South Pacific Islands, a whole bunch of them, to Japan, then Russia, across to Alaska, down Canada, and back in the United States. Okay. So, so it was one of my very longest ferry flights, and it was a lot of fun. So I actually, so the first thing that comes to mind is, how do you survive that long on an airplane without a bathroom? Oh. <laughs> Let me answer this. No. There's two different ways to do it. There's a female way and there's a male. Okay. Way. Right, right. <laughs> I was not on the Tahiti trip, but Joe and I did a trip to India, and um, you know, long days, short nights, lots of long legs, and it was a King Air 200. I was really excited. I thought. Eh, you know, two crew, one of us can step to the back. Well, they had stripped this one down. It had no bathroom in the back of it. The oh, interior no. completely stripped for for the, the other purposes of that plane. And so um, I like to call it strategic dehydration. Right. Uh, okay. <laughs> with, um, I have been there. With some very creative backups just in case, uh, which, you know, so it's like, Deanna, do you want to drink a water? Here's a water bottle, and the answer is? No. <laughs> no, I don't. But, you know, as we all know, it's really important to stay hydrated when flying. You well, know, and your kidneys for... are still functioning. So even right. though you're not taking in, it's still filtering blood, and it's, you're going to have right. you, issues you... eventually. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So, um, you know, drinking drinking lots on the stops and, you know, bathroom breaks right before you go and then just, uh, yeah. We're talking going to the bathroom today in the hangar. <laughs> <laughs> it's a new one. Uh, and it, yeah, okay. And if, you, and if you're a guy, there's a, a couple other ways to handle it and it usually involves a Gatorade bottle. Okay, well that's good go. to know too. I if you really want to know how the I how the needed to know, so yeah. thank you. <laughs> well, so what does it take to be a ferry pilot for those kinds of adventures? You mean to get into this world? Yeah, sure. <laughs> You know, it, uh, it, you, you need to be an accomplished pilot before anybody will ever let you do it. Right. Um, for me, I was a, a very accomplished pilot in terms of credentialing and all this. And my wife asked me, you know, we were talking about what we wanted to do one day and, or what I wanted to do in the world. I was displeased with what I was doing as a career. And I said, I just love to fly airplanes all over the world. And, and, uh, and it just sounds like a lot of fun to, you know, not fly over everything, but stop along the way as I go. And uh, she said, well, why don't you just do it? And I was like, well, I don't know how. Well, the, for me, it ended up that I, I went and Googled ferry piloting, and I ended up with a name called Margaret Waltz. And uh, Margaret is one of the, we, we call her the queen of the Atlantic. She's crossed how many times? 872 wow. to date. Yeah. So we're talking about she's just a, uh, just the quintessential ferry pilot. And uh, Margaret gave me a ride. I flew, uh, I flew one time from uh, Illinois to France, and we stopped along the way as we went. And uh, Margaret was just su such a mentor to me, uh, such, a, uh, such a help, and gave me my first flight. And, uh, and I kind of learned the ropes of how to do it and uh, sort of wet my appetite and then I got to do another one and another one and another one and pretty soon I get to do 
once you do a certain amount, then you get to do a, you know, people, you, your name gets around and you get to do some more. So you can turn this into a full-time career. Be very tough. I tell you know, people ask me a lot about, you know, is it, can you get into a career as a ferry pilot? And the answer is, you probably could. I mean, certain people have done it, but the jobs come so sporadically and you don't know exactly when it's going to happen. It requires the buying and selling of an airplane or the movement of an airplane of some, you know, something to create that. It's almost always a one-off situation and it's not one where you, you know, you're going to get a job every week or every month. So it's, it's a pretty tough one to yeah, it sounds do. like. So how did you get into it, Deanna? It, through Joe, actually. <laughs> so I, I went to work for Joe flying at the King Airs he manages and helping instruct in the PA-46 series. And, um, you know, we were talking about career goals, and I, I mentioned international ferry flights. And he's like, all right, stick it on a scale of 1 to 10. How bad do you want that to happen? And I don't remember. It was you said twenty. Twenty. <laughs> I mean, this is just something that's just been a a long time professional bucket list item, and and so yeah, as soon as the opportunity presented itself for for a trip to come up that you know required two pilots, and yeah, Joe yeah, made it happen. We made it happen. So. I have a running list of pilots that have hear about a ferry flight, or a, or that that hear that I do this, and they're like, you know, if you ever get a seat. You let me know, I'm going, and uh, it's a pretty long list of people that want to do that. But I will oh, yeah. tell you, ferry flying, if I could say it, is a lot like owning a restaurant, meaning it sounds great, it looks like a bunch of fun, but it's a mountain of work to do. If you own a restaurant, you're staying up late, working odd hours, and it's very intense. Ferry flying is kind of the same sort of a thing. Yeah, so, I mean, because you guys aren't just ferrying stuff in the United States. You're no. going international. Yeah. How do you file flight plans for those? Do you guys have issues with customs? I mean, I have so many questions about... Well, you know, and to kind of go along with what Joe was just saying is, you know, one of the questions I've been asked the most since coming back on this last trip was, oh, my gosh, did you get to see such and such? And, you know, what was this country like? And... I don't know. You know, <laughs> we get in late, we get up early. I mean, it's it's some long flying days. You see some things as you go. Uh, you hope for a maintenance delay in a really cool place, which didn't the, happen. The best views are flying in those countries, the, not so right. much. Like on the ground. Yeah, you get to see the airport and the hotel. Yeah, I was going to say, I can tell you what the FBO is like. Right. So <laughs> if you're, you know, if, if you're excited about going and getting to spend time in these countries, that's not what this job is about. Gotcha. That, that's not the way that's happening. Final flight plan, I will say it, uh, it's all international and it's very complicated. Um, it's one of the things that, that really the new person into that doesn't need to do it on them by themselves. There are companies that do that um, mm -hmm. and that, that will manage those logistics uh, throughout. The, the best, I think, is called Shepherd Aero. And we do gobs of work for them and we just think they're great. And they'll do everything from file the flight plans to get the hotels to overflight permits to there's fees just about everything that you want to think of internationally um, and so there's having all that help having someone on the ground that's assisting you it's a windfall of good help okay so have you ever had any issues with security or customs yeah I can tell you you want me to tell you a good one really? <laughs> please <laughs> so I flew an airplane to uh, Muscat Oman and uh, which is over in the Middle East. And, uh, or I, I wasn't flying, I was flying one back. So I flew, and there were four of them, so I got to do four in a row. And the first time I flew over to Muscat, I literally had like a 17 hour flight on an airliner to get over there, which was miserable because I sat in the back of it. It was a miserable flight. Got to security, and I went, it was another 17 hours standing in the security line to get through to that. And it was just, so long and just just a miserable experience so what I ended up doing the next flight is I wore a pilot unif you know, uniform with my little epaulets and a name tag and all those kind of little <laughs> things and uh, when I got off the airplane they were like you come here you know and put me right to the front of the line and five minutes later I'm through everything and I say that to say Everybody take note. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you have the, the stuff on it, it and here's, the, here's the rule, or not the rule, but the, but the truth. The truth of it is, is that 
uh, pilots internationally are held in very high esteem. Very, it, it's, you know, where in America, doctors and lawyers are held in a socioeconomic uh, place. And anywhere else in the world, pilots are held in very, very high esteem, which is great. I love that. But when you look like a pilot, you get treated like a pilot. When you look like a tourist, you get treated like a tourist. So one of the best ways to get through customs and do all those is to look the part. And we kind of experienced this coming back in, you know, at a lot of these stops we had, we had someone prearranged to be there to kind of, someone local who could help us through these security lines and talk the languages and, and help with some of these restrictions. Um, on one of our returns one morning, you know, general aviation isn't a huge segment in a lot of these, these countries, you know. So we're going through a main terminal, um, I believe it was in the UAE, and our, our person wasn't there to help us. So trying to explain to, um, to the security people, hey, we're, we're trying to get to that plane. I mean, you can see it out the window and explain that we're in pilots when we're, I, th I think we both had on polos like this and oh no, I, I had on my blue <laughs> jeans and you know, and I definitely don't look the part of a, of an, of a pilot. He can, he can pass, but you know, it, it was difficult, you know, not, not just having the uniform and then trying to explain on top of that that you're going to a small aircraft. I mean, we had to say multiple times, we, we flew it mm -hmm. in yesterday. Well, on what airline? Not on an airline, you know, we, we flew With that. With very broken English. And With very broken English, oh, and it was, um, it was challenging. So, yeah, looking the, looking <laughs> the part would. Yeah, there's, there, we, we oftentimes will have support personnel in that country that will assist us. And uh, I can't tell you how important those people are. Oh, I believe it. So have you guys had any emergencies while flying a uh, ferry? Well, over, you know, I just, you know, on this flight that I just took, uh, again, Tahiti up through the South Pacific, uh, I landed in Japan uh, and took off from Japan in the evening. So I needed to fly an evening flight uh, that was going to go to Russia. I landed in Russia at midnight and then took off from Russia shortly, just after a fuel stop. Um, and then after taking off from Russia in the pitch dark, the, uh, I had an electrical gremlin where the autopilot failed, and which is a big deal in a King Air in the sense that you got, and then this is a four and a half hour flight, and the comm radio went out completely. And not only the comm radio, but all of the comms that are in one box and the whole- Yeah, that's box. an emergency. It, uh, the question then became, do I go back to the Russia or do I go to Alaska? I was going to Nome, Alaska to land, which is four and a half hours away. And uh, you know, the, to not have an autopilot and not be able to troubleshoot and it, at nighttime, it was just a, it was about all I wanted, you know, at, at that early in the morning or that late, you know, my, my body's out of circadian rhythms and to have to deal with that emergency. So that wasn't like an engine failure or a fire or anything just dastardly, but it was enough. The compounding effects of that were enough to really cause me some grief. It turned out I figured out the autopilot issue and got it back on and uh, ended up talking on guard. There's a way to turn on 121.5, and I was able to relate through some airliners overall there. And I made it to Nome, and it, uh, it, the weather in Nome was great, and it worked out really well. But I got a lot of hand flying that day, and a lot, and, yeah. and you know, one of my best pictures from that flight was the, you know, the sun comes up very slowly in the summertime that time of year, and the, and the sun, it was pitch dark, but the sun began to come up on the horizon, and, wow. and it was like, there's nothing like sunlight when you're in a jam. Oh yeah. And you know, being we're dealing with an emergency in the day is so much better. So I ended up landing in Nome in the day, and um, that was probably one of my more hairy times. It wasn't the hairiest, but just where you are in the world to deal with that was a challenge. So it can happen. So what was your hairiest? My hairiest. Um, they're always the, my hairiest are always dealing with fuel issues. I mean, we we you fly on the edge of the range of the airplane every time. Uh, not every time, but oftentimes you're 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 going a long distance. You don't want to make a bunch of stops. You want to make as few as stops. Uh, probably the the hairiest are always d fuel and is fuel correct. You know, do you, do you trust the gauges? Do you have enough to make it where you need to make it? If it starts to sputter. I would advise landing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but you know, when you're over the South Pacific, um, I remember uh, on this last trip, I landed in Tarawa. 
which is a small island, very historical island related to World War II, lovely place, but it's literally a speck in the middle of an ocean of blue. Um, there, there's no alternate. You got to make that that spot. And I remember landing there with, you know, probably about 45 minutes worth of fuel, which is plenty in the grand scheme of things. But under that context of, I can't just divert over wherever. So fuel is always a concern that's in the back of your mind. Yeah. What would concern me too is, like you mentioned, would be sleep or having your body out of whack with the circadian rhythms. How do you battle fatigue when crossing over multiple time zones like that? The way, the way I did it, or or we kind of did it on the on this last trip was, you immediately adapt to the time zone you're into. I mean, if you get somewhere at nine o'clock at night, but it feels like six p.m., you know where you were, go to bed. It's nine o'clock at night. You get up. You know, all of our starts were on local time, so you know immediately adapt to that time zone. Um, and I think we did pretty good until probably day four or five of it's this trip. Yeah. It is cumulative. You know, you start, once you get to the eighth, ninth, tenth time zone in just a few days, you know, you start to feel the effects. And that's when, I, I'll be honest, having a, a second crew member was was fabulous because that's when, you know, that's when you're likely, you have a really, we had one 11 hour flight time day, not counting the fuel stops in between. And, you know, it was a, just a really long day. And I, you know, just think about had that been single pilot, just the mistakes at that point in time after on that day and those leg lengths and with the, the constant time zone changes, the mistakes that could have happened that was, you know, really nice to have a second person along on. Um, but yeah, you know, it really uh, I carry, hit I, me I, after we got I carry, home. Uh, I don't, I don't drink uh, high energy drinks and all that, but I'll have a, I'll, like, I'll have a six pack of Coke with me. Mm -hmm. I like Coke and I'll have one of those along and, and I'll, uh, uh, I'll have a podcast that I'll listen to or a, a magazine that I'll read. I'll do, you fight through it. There's some boring times on a long ferry flight. And so you got to pass that time uh, away. I've never had a problem uh, falling asleep in the, you know, in the airplane, and the, the, it's uh, meaning it's just something that I, I, somehow my body stays alert and ready to go when I'm flying. Awesome. Well, I'll ask you one last question. What's it like flying in countries where English is not the primary language, and so you're having to work with all these controllers that there may be some language barriers just even with their accents and, and whatnot? How challenging is it? You know, I I thought it was I thought it was a lot a lot of fun. You know, you go English is the official language worldwide for aviation, but the accents and the dialects completely change it from what we're used to. I mean, you think about you know you go here from South United States to the Northern uh, states, and you know pilots and controllers have a hard time communicating. You start mixing it up between the countries, and it gets really interesting. Um, there was one exchange we weren't a part of, but listening to an Irish controller trying to get a frequency across to an obviously American pilot. And I mean, there were a couple times there I just wanted to step in and just give the frequency for him. I yeah. mean, here's what he said. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was just the, this... the, the worst control, not the worst controllers, but the worst accents are Egypt. Egypt, Egypt is really tough. Uh, the Japan, I just flew through Japan, although they're great controllers, but the, it's such a different language mm -hmm. that it's hard. Uh, China was pretty tough uh, to, to understand, but the, you, you listen up, you kind of know what a radio call, what the expected call is going to be, and so you can kind of couch that with what you expect and, and frame it and build it up to what it, you know, so you can usually, usually handle it. Awesome. Is, is usually what happens. I would agree with the, Egypt was the toughest to understand. There was a lot of asking to repeat and I, and I have lots of forgiveness and I'll, when I'm when I'm going into an international country if I'm speaking I'll I'll speak with a very clear English accent with very proper phraseology that that I'll be very clear so they understand me I mean if I had to learn Egyptian with that was the international language of aviation I'd be in a world of hurt so I have lots of uh, lots of patience and forgiveness when it comes to that to those kind of things well, I feel like I learned a lot today. Thank you guys so much for being here. As always, if you like what you saw today, subscribe and share and join us next time in the hangar.